Good evening, friends, once again, and let me show you something. Hey, when you change the context of something, it gives it a totally different meaning. And right off the bat, see this right here? All right, that, what that's representing is, and obviously this line right here is, is uh, 2021. This little line right there, this little, little uh, bar, represents all the vaccine adverse event reports reported to VAERS just for the first week of 2022. Now, when you look at that, you go, well, that's kind of innocuous. And if we look at it this way too, just the same, for example, right there, 1.34 megabytes, that's the zip file size compared to all the other years. Now, this is VAERS, and so, but when we do this, are you ready? Let's check this out. We take it like this, and for example, let's do this again too, just one more time, and you see where we're going. This right here is the first week of 2022. These right here are the total years of each one respectively, all the way through 1999 at 1.33. So yes, what we're looking at is actually to put things in context, do you see how the context changes now? As far as its meaning, what we are literally looking at is the first week of 2022 reports to VAERS is actually more than the entire year of 1999. 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, 93, 92, and 91. And we have just begun. And with that in mind, a good idea. Let me reset this real fast. I really, now I see now it's kind of like, now you barely notice it. Uh, let's put this in perspective now as far as on the, the, um, the chart itself from VAERS. And this will be a good opportunity to cover the um, disclaimer from VAERS at the same time. Vera's disclaimer, which we go through every night just to play it safe, is as follows. The report may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable, which is true because we we have the opportunity to, the way we do the data and look at it over at night, to see exactly how a lot of these reports are written. So a lot of them may not be uh, eloquent in their approach or statistical or, or clinical, but however, though, they are reports just the same. And in large part, reports of errors are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases. And also, too, in the defense of others that brought this up, data, as far as up to this date, has shown that basically all adverse event reports, probably only 1% actually get reported to VAERS. Um, But again, I would like to see that data updated. All right, now, let us begin looking at our research where our selection bias, which again, selection bias is a common thing, doesn't mean it's necessarily bad, especially since the selection bias that you and I have partaken in has been far more accurate than the selection bias others have done. So let us proceed, and it's not a contest, but let us proceed just the same. If regrettably, if our path had been taken and other mitigation and prophylactics uh, strategies were basically incorporated, um, we may have had a better outcome than they have, and I'm trying to be nice. All right, role of probiotics management to COVID-19, the computational perspective. All right, T cells from common colds, cross protect against infection with SARS-CoV-2. I know it's another report in reference to having the common cold gives you SARS-CoV-2 protection, but this article right here highlights why the inoculations don't have the same impact as a common cold. All right, after that, Oregon State research shows hemp compounds prevent coronaviruses from entering human cells. Yes, I did a video on that uh, just actually January 11th, and where'd it go? But after that, but yes, I did a video on that, and of course now I I don't, they haven't, there we go, I'm back again. All right, and, but however though, again, I wanna recover for the data, uh, that individuals that didn't get a chance to watch the video last week. But however, though, what the hemp compounds do in short, it's got to be the acids. And I will stress over and over again, because these are the precursors. That has to be the precursors because the mechanism at which it works is like a glue-like effect 
which basically prohibits the spike proteins uh, from basically docking with the ACE2 receptors. Don't want to make it sound technical, but it's very mechanistic. And the cool part about this, again, to look at this over and over again, be mechanistic as far as the cannabidiolic, the, the gorolic acid and the cannabidiolic acid. It may not, I mean, it's future research portends in reference to prophylactic strategies uh, could possibly be a benefit to individuals which are immunocompromised, which can't take things uh, like uh, potentially like inoculations and things like that without undue risk. So research has to be conducted in living organisms like people uh, to see if that's validated, but it's so freaking cool. All right, well, I'll, I'll proceed forward again. How much often, how much often? See, it's, it's gonna lay tonight. How often I reported the benefits of the UVC light? In a perfect world where basically individuals which are actually concerned about pandemic mitigation and using all the arsenals at their disposal, uh, UVC light should have been installed in public arenas, spacing, uh, things along those lines, because it's just to put it in perspective or context, that's the word of the night context, UVC com exposure completely prevents airborne transmission between individuals. And this is a reference to Delta. Now, the work on Omicron, uh, that'd be really nice to know. But however, though, um, have any of you, I mean, a few places have incorporated UVC light, uh, sometimes in the ventilation systems, but there are, are safe UVC lights that have been studied in regard to public arenas, which don't harm the skin or the eye or anything like that. And I think it was two to two or something like that, uh, nanometers, uh, which I haven't seen yet after two years. Mask up distance inoculate uh we're so much better than that but here let's proceed forward uh infectious viral load unvaccinated and vaccinated patients infected with sars cov 2 delta and omicron all right sounds again boring i don't want to use the word too much because sometimes i can be but however though something is weird with omicron and again we've had the best forward intelligence in regard to the researchers that we've selected at the research articles because Omicron doesn't appear to be as dependent upon viral load as Delta. And for example, you see the correlation between RNA copies and infectious viral teeters was low for basically both groups, but something is really weird. And they both come into that conclusion. Omicron's infectiousness may not be explained uh, by higher viral loads measured in the nose and the mouth by RT-PCR. And the weird part about that, and not to give it too much away, we'll come back to it, is if we scroll all the way down, and we will come back to this article. Uh, again, these are two separate research articles having similar uh, observations in regards to the outcome. The higher transmissibility in Omicron doesn't seem to be related to the shedding of an increased number of infectious virus particles in vaccinated individuals. They don't know. And so you, you get that. Uh, it's interesting. It's intriguing. We may be looking at the wrong thing, or there may be some other way of transmission that we have not yet discovered. Again, it's kind of weird. We're always, like with wars, we're always prepared for the last war we fought. Don't want to be crass. But even in regard to pandemic mitigation, like, well, obviously, you know, lockdowns, distancing, and masks. That's, we've seen that from, what was it again? The Justinian plague. So we're still fighting the Black Death. But outside of that, modern technology has been discovered something is different. And is it the terrain? Remember the argument from Pasteur uh, and so on and so forth in regard to illness? If you throw a mask on somebody, you, then you throw them into the cold, wet, does that mask protect them from pneumonia or getting into the cold or some of the illness? And what, how, I mean, if they're by themselves in the cold with a mask on, it doesn't protect them from a lot of the illnesses which they may succumb to. Uh, but yet, you know, how is it transmission? Is it the terrain? Is it that old argument from a long time ago? But let us proceed forward. And then also to that as well. And then we'll cover some of the fun ones, face masks, uh, face masks make wearers look more attractive, studies suggest. Um, yeah, I know you're going to read it and you go, oh my gosh, this is propaganda. It's not really propaganda. It's it's decent research uh, per se. For example, even through my observation, 
you know, within the past two years, people used to hold the door open for each other. Uh, they used to help each other a lot more. Now, from my observational biases, uh, from my what they used to call in psychology a monkey sphere, uh, basically, I don't people. I mean, you notice yourself. Do people even hold the door open for each other any longer? Are those small courtesies? which binds society together and each other together, community, regardless of political ideology or the belief structure, I don't see them anymore. Dysbiosis is more than just the microbiome per se. All right, then also too, how COVID-19 pandemic imitated global, Im imitated, that's a new word. How pandemic imitated, pandemic impacted global trust in government. Really kind of interesting. We have to read the whole thing through. Yet yeah, countries that have enforced strict restrictions, including China, were found to have an increased sense of public trust. All right, I know. The chances are of you watching this video channel, you're looking to get everything in full context and recognize there's a lot of propaganda out there. But regardless of that, it's a decent study. It actually looks at it. And it also gives a caveat if it continues too long at the exact same time. So the trick is not to discount the study because the outcome is against our particular biases. The trick is to actually look at the study and see exactly, number one, why it annoys the heck out of us. Number one, I already know. And number two, what was the tr how did the researcher come to that conclusion? Which sometimes the, the path to those conclusions are very enlightening as well. But without further ado, let's begin with the first article as we begin. Role of probiotics and management to COVID-19 in a computational perspective. Again, we're focusing on the lung microbiome, but this one article, it has got so much great information in it that it's worth of luck. And then this is an interesting thing too, the gut lung access, keep that in mind. So let's proceed forward. More than 70% of the body's immune cells are located in the GI tract, indicating a direct connection between the immune system and intestinal microflora. Remember when COVID first came out per se, and everyone was always saying there's always a mass amount of gastrointestinal upset and so on and so forth that was associated with it. Uh, and then it kind of just faded into obscurity. No one was paying attention to the GI anymore. Well, let's go back. And that's what they're doing. And so to pick up some of the highlights. Similarly, intranasal administration, remember the nasal and the mouth seem to be the real primary venue. Remember they looked at the eyes too, and that became a whole different dynamic, but still just the same. Lactobacillus casse, strain Shirota, I want to say Shiratora, white tiger, Shirota, stimulated the interleukin-12 production and natural killer cell activity, resulting in adequate protection against H1N1 infection. Lactobacillus fermentum, leading to an antiviral effect against influenza, uh, H3N2 in the intestine, lung and small intestine. Lactobacillus plantarum. All right, this one right here, right there, Lactobacillus plantarum, focus on. That's going to be the main crux of this article, uh, research article. Lactobacillus pent, uh, pentosis, Lactobacillus plantarum, go H3N2. Lactobacillus pentosis, uh, so this gives you a wonderful laundry, laundry list against different mitigation strategies or tools uh, ahead of the game. Virus strains, influenza virus strains, Lactobacillus casarity. Uh, uh, basically respiratory viruses, uh, Lactobacillus rhamnos, which is a great uh, use for a probiotic, multifunction uh, against multiple different ailments, uh, work really well when nasally administered, nasally, nasally, na oh, nasally, there it is, nasally administered. All right, to proceed. A healthy lung also has been demonstrated to have its own specific microbiota, including Prevotella, Streptococcus, Vialana, and Fusobacterium and Hemophilus, Hemophilus, Hemophilus. I'm probably going to pronounce that, please forgive me. And so what's happened is, which is really kind of cool, as we brought in the beginning, you have the lung has its own microbiome. And the major concern with face masks and things like that, uh, especially keeping people indoors, initially when we first started doing these videos, was dysbiosis. Now, obviously, people are thinking dysbiosis of the gut, but dysbiosis of the lung. If you are deprived of these bacteria, which you're probably not going to get from your living room couch, uh, basically when you finally take your mask off, does that leave you more vulnerable? Does dysbiosis a healthy thing? 
Again, that's for epidemiologists to decide, per se. Dysbiosis, the gut and lung and COVID-19 patients. There we are. Proceed. Again, I'm only picking the highlights. I'd love to be able to read you the entire research article, but that would put you to sleep. Proceed. As many as several potential phytochemicals, this is really kind of cool. So looking at the, this gives you a little bit more information too. So you're reading through these all, these chemicals all through, or salic acid, glycerin, you know, glycerin from grapes. Uh, see this where I'm mumbling, glycerolytic acid, uh, which from licorice and so on and so forth. Remember, epigallogatogen, EGCG from green tea, theoflavon, black tea, theoflavon, black tea, pomegranate peel extract, honeysuckle. Remember honeysuckle in reference to uh, did about when we were all concerned about Ebola a long, long time ago. Uh, but a honeysuckle also came out favorable against SARS-CoV-2, the ludulum. But they had, uh, remember microRNA? You look at way back in the, re of the videos that we did a long time ago, we were discussed the micro microRNA in reference to honeysuckle, and that was years ago. In fact, let's just see real fast. Hang on a second. I'll take a Let's, when do we do the honeysuckle article? Honeysuckle. We do that. And let's see. And nope, that's not ours. Please forgive me. Da, da, da. And the graphic that you and I are both right here. to my right. There it is. Please forgive me on this one. Just take a second. Honeysuckle. So I want to give an idea exactly how long they known about the microRNA outside of basically what they were doing. Yeah. So this was done. Uh, we did seven years ago. And then the one in reference to SARS CoV-2 was done a year ago. And I'll see if we have the one uh, from a long, long time ago. No. Seven years ago, we did the honeysuckle targets viruses, MIR-29111. H1N1, H5N1, H7N9. So that's how long they've known about honeysuckle as a whole from October 2014. That is just incredible. All right, but to proceed forward. All right, so basically we look at that and let's finish this article off. Da, da, da. And it goes to wonderful explanation that Lactobacillus plantarum as a promise to COVID-19. It goes exactly at how it does what it's supposed to do. It does not give dosaging. That's the one thing. It shows potential. But to conclude, the case study that we researched and provided discloses the antiviral potential of Lactobacillus plantarum metabolites against SARS-CoV-2 and SP13 using molecular docking method as an example proving the possibility of studying molecular insight of probiotics against COVID-19. Therefore, integrating probiotic data with existing computational tools would significantly benefit COVID-19 research. So that is really actually kind of cool as far as looking at the additional tools. I know last week we did uh, Lactobacillus plantarum as well. I know not Lactobacillus plantarum, other probiotics as well. But it really gives a good uh, explanation of the gut and lung uh, access. So there it is. Again, I know it's kind of uh, vague, but... The main thing is it's another friendly bacteria, which seems to help against something which is not so friendly, such as SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Uh, so basically that holds a lot of promise. Now, next one. T cells from common cold cross protect against infection with SARS-CoV-2. A new study in Nature Communications, basically by Imperial College, provides the first evidence of a protective role of these T cells. While previous studies have shown that T cells induced by other coronaviruses can recognize SARS-CoV-2, the new study examines for the first time how the presence of these T cells at the time of SARS-CoV-2 exposure influences whether someone becomes infected. It's not about just the antibodies. In fact, I talked to a lot of medical professionals, and they'll tell you the most ill individuals have the highest antibody levels. Current vaccines do not, and I will reiterate, Current vaccines do not induce immune response to these internal proteins. The researchers say that alongside our existing effective spike protein targeting vaccines, these internal proteins offer a new vaccine target that could provide long lasting protection because the T cell response persists longer than the antibody responses, which wane after a few months after vaccination. Even if you are very pro-ra-ra-ra -ra -ra vaccine, 
in order to maintain this type of thing, uh, they were starting to recommend taking vaccines every four months. And yeah, the booster does seem to raise antibodies, but does that mean the booster gives protection? You know, again, uh, the spike protein is under intense immune pressure from vaccine-induced antibodies, which drives the evolution of vaccine escape mutants. Reiterate, the spike protein is under intense immune pressure from vaccine-induced antibody, which drives evolution of the vaccine escape mutants, which is probably the number one reason in the beginning a lot of the medical community was terrified of administering a leaky vaccine. Instead, we decided to even up one more. You would consider any immune protection been more beneficial than the opportunity for uh, vaccine evolution. Uh, normally, leaky vaccines uh, were always frowned upon, but we have an extremely leaky vaccine. The question is, does that leaky vaccine increasing viral fitness? All right. In contrast, the internal protein targeted by the protected T cells we identified mutate much less. So T cells, less mutation. Consequently, they are highly conserved between the various SARS-CoV-2 variants, including Omicron. New vaccines that include these conserved internal proteins would therefore induce broadly protected T cells responses that should protect against the current and future SARS-CoV-2, which is kind of cool. Again, it's not being anti-vaccine. I just, you know, I'm just suspicious, so highly suspicious of which the, um, and which not just the expediency, but the fact is the vaccine, even if you say it worked great against D614G, uh, every time there's a new variant of concern, you're dealing with an entirely new uh, element. And again, is this the proper vaccine against Omicron? Uh, antibodies against Omicron? Yeah, fine, whatever. Is that actually reduce the opportunity for infection or a reduction in severe illness? And then you have the healthy user uh, biases as well, too. Proceed. Oregon State Research shows hemp compounds prevent coronaviruses from entering human cells. Very mechanistic in its approach. These compounds, the cannabinoid borolic acid, uh, CBGA, and cannabidiolic diolic acid, CBDA. Again, if you want to see the whole thing, uh, go back to the video we just did, uh, per se, right here. And I'll go through the, the whole thing there. But however, briefly, as we research, research as we read. We're not researching, we're researching other researchers' research. Uh, the spike protein is the same drug target used in COVID-19 vaccines and antibody therapy. A drug target is any molecule critical to the process a disease follows, meaning its disruption can thwart infection or disease progression. This is how it works. Very basic, and to reiterate from our prior uh, research article earlier this week, they bind to the spike proteins. So the proteins can't bind to the ACE2 enzyme. Very mechanistic, which is abundant on the outer membrane of the endothelial cells in the lungs and other organs. To proceed forward, they have the potential to prevent as well as treat infection by SARS-CoV-2, CBDA, and CBD, CBGA are produced from the hemp plant as precursors to CBD and CBG. So I want to emphasize, these are the precursors. Don't please do not confuse CBD and CBG with CBDA and CBGA. All right, very important. But I'll have the links to the research article regardless for you to follow as is. And then one of my favorite, favorite non-oppressive, not oppressive, uh, mitigation strategies, UVC light. Again, I would have loved to see it incorporated early, especially in public arenas, transport, so on and so forth. Um, it would have been really cool. You know, two years later on, I wait. Behavioral medical control measures are not effective in containing the spread of SARS-CoV-2. That's their words, not mine. All right, and because it looks pretty obvious, uh, but here we report on the effectiveness of preemptive environmental strategy, preemptive. So it's something you could have on all the time, especially the safer forms of UVC, without having to worry. I mean, otherwise you're gonna be wearing masks against everything. Uh, environmental strategy using UVC light to prevent airborne transmission of the virus in hamster models. At least at this point, you know, masks don't make you healthy. Um, now, obviously, that's the best defense. It's a healthy population. 
ask any farmer. UVC exposure completely prevents airborne transmission between individuals. Their words, not mine. Let me scroll down. Da 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 da. Pictures of mice. Da, da, do, 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 do. Non-medical interventions such as social distancing rely on the assumption that small airborne respiration droplets will settle to the ground within two meters from the source. Assumption. Not good for science, is it? A lot of things work in labs really, really well, but in the real world, totally different ballgame. However, true aerosols in diameter, diameter to micrograms and micrometers in diameter, uh, will remain suspended floating on air currents for an extended amount of time and can travel more than two meters and remain suspended for minutes to hours. Microns, I'm think microns. In addition, other medical countermeasures such as mask wearing are highly dependent on compliance and as such have had varying levels of effectiveness across different cultural, political, and religious environments. And the Koreans did an interesting article in this because they were looking at the N95 mask a long time uh, before coronavirus. And when administered to the public, administered, one handed out to the public, they their data was like, again, Please forgive me if I'm wrong, but the percentage is pretty close. 14% of the population actually was wearing the N95 mask properly once. I mean, they were able to put it on properly once. That's it. And so they said handing an N95 mask was just superfluous. All right, you see what I mean? That was their belief back then. I don't know how the virtue signaling has progressed to today, but still just the same. Preemptive environmental interventions in public spaces that are not dependent on compliance of, of at the risk populations would be highly cost effective non medical countermeasures to help control the current pandemic. In addition, given the pathogen agnostic nature of UVC germicidal irradiation, it has potential to curb airborne transmission of fungal, bacterial, viral, and everyday maladies like the common cold. Funded by National Health, National Health, National Institutes of Health. I right, but still just the same. Um, and they go through room exchanges, 24 room exchanges, as opposed to one to two. It would have been, you. the trick is they're, they're realists. Whoever the researchers are here, here on, the, on the UVC are realists. They're not saying that these mitigation strategies don't work that are being used today, that have also been used since uh, the 1300s. But they're, so what they're saying is basically, we're a modern society. You're fighting last millennia's plague with last millennia strategies. And I mean, seriously, they did the same thing. You saw the masks back in those old pictures in school and the black death that everything around. Um, but you were, what the heck? This would have been cool. Can you imagine going to bars, stadiums, airlines, in it just generally just have something that's uh, pretty much passive? In reference to pandemic mitigation strategies, as far as as opposed to something which creates so much division or divisiveness, and seriously with kids, this is so much more preferable, at least in my eyes. Again, our selection bias may be better than their selection bias. Here we go. This is interesting. Now, this brings more questions than answers, but it's important. Just to say, well, let's go to the top. Here we are. Now keep in mind, infectious viral load in unvaccinated and vaccinated patients infected with SARS-CoV-2, wild type Delta and Omicron. The objective here is not to find out which is better or who's better, who's better when protecting and so on and so forth, but it highlights something is unusual. And again, with our forward intelligence, so far we've been pretty accurate. And so let's get our foot in the door in regard to this uh, level of awareness or observation and see how it proceeds down the line. A viral load, remember VL. So VL is gonna be viral load. As RNA, viral load is only a weak proxy for infectiousness. You haven't heard that in your TV stations, have you? Infectious viral teeters, IVT, remember IVT, infectious viral te teeters, titer teeters. Correlation between RNA copy number and IVT was low for all groups. IVT, infectious, viral teeters, titers teeters. All right, and so we proceed forward. Omicron vaccine breakthrough infections did not show elevated infectious viral teeters compared to Delta. 
Interesting. Suggesting that other mechanisms that increase viral load contribute to the high infectiousness of Omicron. So they don't know what it is, but they notice there's a difference and a big difference to proceed forward. And obviously we've seen it because it's infectious, the most infectious thing out of all the coronaviruses by far, but it doesn't really hurt people as bad as Delta does, but still just the same, something's different. And it's important, especially if there's any other potential uh, mutation and no one's bothered to install UVC lights. So proceed. The contribution of viral loads to the high transmissibility of Omicron is not known so far. Neither is the mechanism behind the higher transmissibility, transmissibility of Omicron. You see the mystery beginning to build? It's almost like if you had, it's almost like the virus or whatever you want to call it as far as the coronavirus family is almost like mocking. Every pandemic, every pandemic mitigation attempt that bureaucratic establishments have attempted to incorporate, thinking this is easy to do, uh, the virus has found a way around. And yet it's not alive per se. Higher transmissibility of Omicron. First, in, you have to redefine life. Higher, first in vitro data hint towards alternative entry mechanisms as well as early replication peak in cell culture, but no clinical data for this phenomenon exists so far. The higher transmissibility in Omicron doesn't seem to be related to the shedding of an increased number of infectious virus particles in vaccinated individuals. So a lot more questions than answers. Let's see if I scroll down. That was about it. And then what happens is I'm reading through the articles here, I'll glance through them. Different, different research article, viral dynamics and duration of PCR positivity, the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant. You start seeing the exact same thing popping up and totally different research articles, total different parts of the world, total different researchers, further suggests that Omicron's infectiousness may not be explained by the higher viral load measure to the nose and mouth from RT-PCR. So we're fighting Omicron like we're fighting Delta, but Omicron is different in a lot of ways, but yet we're fighting it as if we're fighting last, what is it, this ever, uh, the average variant lasts about four months, the last variant. So Delta, we're fighting as we're fighting beta, we fight Delta as we're fighting beta, we're fighting beta as we fight alpha. So we're like always one step behind the curve. And that's, or it's always one step ahead of us per se, unless we incorporate more intelligent mitigation, pandemic mitigation strategies such as UVC light and more prophylactic strategies that basically help those individuals which are prone as opposed to inoculating an entire population with the leaky vaccine, which only goes in one direction because only one most, you're only going to increase viral fitness with leaky vaccines. So this can continue on and on and on. All right, part to proceed. All right, next, da, da, da. benign vasculation syndrome in migraine or this is what research we're doing. Let's proceed forward. Let's just read the highlights. Thus far, several neurological IEFEIs, adverse events following immunization related to this particular vaccine have been reported. Some examples, which are Bell's palsy, Julian Barre, I want to say Julian Barr, Julian Barre syndrome, multiple sclerosis like central nervous system demyelination syndrome, and rhombocephalitis as well as functional neurological disorders. All right, I know I just read through it kind of fast. Let's read through it a little slower. Thus far, several neurological, basically adverse event following immunizations, AEFIs related to the BNT162B2 vaccine have been reported. Some examples, some, which are Bell's palsy, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis like central nervous system demyelination syndrome, and rhombocephalitis, as well as other functional neurological disorders. The pathophysiological mechanisms for these phenomena and potential relation to the vaccine are still mostly unknown. All right. This includes, they include muscle vasculations, Vasculations, muscle twitching, and migraine aura, 
without headache, as well as palpitations, excitation, and insomnia. Proceed forward. Even though it is by no means possible to claim causality. So I want to reiterate that. They're noticing these things. It doesn't mean that they can't be background rates. Background rates meaning you're doing a mass inoculation. This would occur in the population anyways. And you're picking it up uh, safety signals, which really would make no difference. They're not higher in a vaccinated group as unvaccinated groups, so on and so forth. So they're not trying to apply causality as of yet. They're noticing. And everything starts first with, hmm. And they stop and look. And now what they're doing is asking other researchers to say, hey, stop, look, observe. Are we just not recording this? Or should we start recording it and see if we actually have a signal in VAERS, which may be uh, disconcerting? Therefore, we decided to present this case to the scientific medical community in order to lay a potential foundation stone. You see where they're coming with that? In order to help medical professionals whose patients might have similar ailments that they have suspected to be possible in relation to vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. It's like the breakthrough infections. In the beginning, no one, you know, with inoculations, they said breakthrough infections were rare. Then they said um, adverse events were rare. Then they said, you know, you can't, you know, you even heard the, you even heard the president of the United States say certain things in regard to inoculations, which obviously were not true. But once someone lays this foundation stone, it basically opens the door for other medical research to say, hey, maybe I won't get fired if I research this. Yeah, we live in a wonderfully uh, interesting time. We believe that the antithyroid antibodies might have been transitly increased during that time, possibly the result as presumed widespread autoimmune reaction. It is important to note that autoimmune thyroid disease, especially Graves' disease, has been observed both in patients following COVID-19 infection and several patients following SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. So again, is this higher than this? Or is this higher than this? You see what I mean? All right, we hypothesize that if this presented phenomena were casually connected to the vaccine, that they were mediated by unknown immunological reaction, potentially involving cross-reactivity in molecular mimicry, mimicry, mimicry related to spike proteins. Furthermore, the idea that such spike protein-related autoimmune reactions as possibly seen here and in post-COVID-19 syndrome might affect the most sensitive and already micro-damaged organ systems, the locus minoris, uh, please, this one I have a hard time with. Minoris resistentiae uh, is also noteworthy. The mentioned hypotheses are, at this point, of course, mere theories are impossible to prove. But it begins. They're trying to say, not prove him. They don't want to. They don't want to get in trouble by claiming causality. Causality means it's a direct re relationship between the vaccination and all this nasty stuff. They're just trying to say, hey, we noticed a connection, some circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is not guilt. It just means, let's start looking. Now, the interesting aspect about this, and as you already know, we've covered a tremendous number of articles already in regard to neurological something. And Again, neurological issues, just background rates, meaning it's the same amount that would occur in the population as it is. And it's just coincidence that they appear at the time of vaccination. Those questions are going to become more and more profound. And the reason being, as stated before, you know, we look at this, right? And we look at this level. That's why. Why one week in January higher than complete years? And again, that's just the data as it stands. It's an interesting question. It's perplexing. All right, then after that, face mask wearers look more attractive, that he says. Um, now, again, this is a bias, and this has nothing to do with health. And actually, I take that back. It doesn't deal with health because... 
personally myself, I, from my background, I have a hard time seeing people with masks all the time. Doesn't mean I dislike the person. And I understand the motivation behind wearing the masks, and I respect that. However, though, I'm not a fan. And data-wise, medically, or or cosmetically. And from a cosmetic approach, though, you have to look at it. Some people, they are much, very much fans, and I have to respect that as well. Our study suggests that face masks are considered most attractive when covered by medical face masks, faces. Now, me personally, that color blue, um, I find repulsive. Now, the interesting thing about it is research carried out before the pandemic found medical face masks reduced attractiveness. Now, they increase attractiveness. Is that kind of like Maslow's hierarchy, maybe, that they're safe, and therefore, if they're safe, they're attractive? Just kind of like food, uh, when it had a sweet taste to it, it was like less likely to be bitter, and they're less likely to be bitter, be poisonous. Therefore, the food became more attractive in that aspect. We also found faces considered significantly more attractive when covered by both cloth face masks than when not covered. Now, obviously, hiding undesirable features in the lower part of the face. Yeah, we have the... Which happens to be the nose and the mouth. Uh, you know, I still think a smile is a, is a pretty attractive thing, regardless. But if you're not into smiles, then, then I guess covering them up may do the trick. Again, <laughs> seriously. Just covering this up because, again, it's, it, 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 it exposes biases, including my own. How COVID-19 pandemic indicated a global trust of government. Government, all right? Research found that the containment of the disease was usually impactful on public trust in government. Countries that enforced strict restrictions, including China, were found to have an increased sense of public trust. I like to see that survey. As they enabled effective containment of the virus from the outset. However, in places that not strictly enforced lockdowns and restrictions such as Sweden, public trust was seen to decrease. Now, again, I mentioned the word monkey sphere. In my monkey sphere or my echo chamber, my selection bias, or my observational biases, a lack of context, I actually found Sweden more trustworthy. But again, whoever they did the study with, whoever they did the, regardless of that, you have to look at this and see how they come to that conclusion. And even though I may disagree with it completely, they still can be totally right, per, per se. And even though that's against my um, values, the self-determination and independence. Because I'm a highly independent person. I find anybody that does that, you know, is I'm totally adverse to. But however, though, you know, my opinion is not equal to their opinion. While restrictions initially, now here's the caveat. While restrictions initially, this should, this should go to Australia. Australia, pay attention to this in Canada. While restrictions initially increased public trust, the more they went on, the further they impacted social freedoms, causing stress, anxiety, and even resentment provoking rebellious behavior and sparking the distrust in government. I wonder if that has anything to do with two years of this. So in the beginning, as you read through it, because wow, they're taking control. They know what they're doing. Da, 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 da. Two years of this, you're going, well, maybe they don't really know what they're doing. And, you know, what the heck? And so again, you have to read through the article. Uh, Basically, it's it's also errors are to a warning. So I think it was it was finally well rounded. And right, now let's look at the data. Here we go. Pop back actually kind of early. Here it there we proceed. All right, we looked at this. This is the various file size. We went through the disclaimer. Our data sources also do just real fast. Are your their vigilance? Uh, they're still doing the. Uh, they're not going year by year like VARES does. They're going by vaccine, vaccine. So you'll see exactly the number of adverse event reports reported to endure vigilance in regard to just the COVID uh, vaccines themselves. Uh, Our World and Data, wonderful data source. GIS aid, which changed its dynamics. So I don't have the variants available yet uh, because they usually get through Our World and Data, but there was some licensing problems. And then, of course, the CDC itself. So, but to proceed as follows. There is that comparison. There's 2022 right down there, just being born as far as regard to the VAERS database, as far as the adverse event reports, pretty serious stuff. But now let's watch how that grows. So the first week, uh, how would you make sure you want to make bet the second week? This is about as large as 2001, 2002, and so forth. 
All right, let's begin. Let's go back to the states here. Some disconcerting information. Let's give it a second to build. This is new deaths per 100,000. Now, what we're looking at is basically right here, April 15, 2020, we are 2.84 uh, individuals succumb per 100,000. All the technology and everything we've done and so on and so forth, what are we at now? 3.67, six. So really it makes it almost look like a practice in futility. You would think that by now we'd be better, but not. Now there could be some confounding or conflation or whatever you want to talk about it, uh, but still that's the data as is. And the data as it stands is regardless of whatever prophylactic treatments we're utilizing and so on and so forth, uh, on paper, regardless of the reasoning behind it, we're not doing better uh, by far, per se. And so proceed forward. Let's look at this. New now check this out. Ready? Look at this. This is new cases moved per 100,000. Now I'll look at these particular states because we'll always like comparisons. Look at that spike. California, totally different pandemic mitigation strategies. Totally different. All the masking and restrictions and things like that. And look at that. No real difference. So again, science to me is observation. And observationally, the lockdown strategies that California has implemented, not any good. All right, then, you have, then we have the East Coast in Central in Texas. So we have New York going up a little bit. And then Texas. Uh, about the same. So we do it like this, for example, by the week. There we are. Florida and California are pretty much matched, but now let's check out the mortality for 100,000. Are you ready? Whoops. Move up like this. And it's frozen for a second. There we are. Now let's look at the mortality. This is where the, the whole game, possibly seroprevalence and natural immunity come into play and, and everything else like that. Now, now also vaccine mandates. And so let's go to Florida where it has no vaccine mandate. Let's just compare it observationally. Uh, I know what may work in a lab and what may be hypothetical and conjecture, but I like real world results. And this is the real world results. What do we have here? We just going back last week. Florida, by far, the mortality is still continuing to decrease per 100,000. And Texas, Better than New York, California, about the same. So all those pandemic mitigation lockdowns and strategies and everything else like that, and none of this, no gatherings and so on and so forth, at least in regard to California compared to Florida, futility, pure practice and futility. Does that mean the population of California enjoys living in that type of environment? Um, I don't know. We keep having the same politicians in place. Maybe they, Maybe individuals feel more secure under uh, that type of effect. But regardless of that, when it comes to the pandemic, regardless of the emotional biases involved by the population, uh, Florida is kicking butt. California, I have no clue. All right, including New York, no clue. Texas, a few more freedoms, still just the same. And again, could have been that they just had more exposure early on and so on and so forth. There's an averaging game. I don't know, but there it is. All right, let's proceed. Uh, VARES 2021, we closed out. VARES 2022. There we go. Now, remember, we only had seven days worth of reporting, but this will give you a good perspective in regard to that. All right, now what we're looking at here, make sure we go forward. This is just the first week. And please forgive me, the data frame which we're looking at right now, uh, I was using DASC trying to speed things up. So these are the individuals so far that died within one day of the shot starting. 2022 in regard to reports to VARES. So sorry, nine mortality of nine individuals within one day of the shot had succumbed. And please forgive the line breaks there, as you can see, um, because uh, again, it has to do with me working with different programs. I was trying to speed up with DASCs, which didn't read the line breaks properly. So, but that's what it is. But these are the individuals uh, which unfortunately have succumbed within the first within a day of inoculation. 
Again, correlation is not causal. Um, but now you, with starting out like this, you can get more of an idea of what the reports uh, imply. For example, it says, you know, so per se. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, let's go here. Now what you're doing here, even though we're in January, you're not looking back a week. These are reports that are now coming in from as far as, you know, 300 days ago or more. So if you look at mortality, 350 days ago, this individual may have um, died. But however, the, the oxygen is, I mean, oxygen, for the report is now coming out of the reaction. And so you could see uh, basically what's occurring. All right, but now that's just begun. And so we scroll down. These are individuals which support, which passed away within 10 days of inoculation. And so far we only have 17 uh, for the first week of January. But now keep in mind, these are each different individuals. So as we look at their stories, see if you notice, a, see if you can notice a connection. All right, this is just random. Pulmonary embolism. This one's bizarre. The doctors say that we thought we were looking at someone else's scans. They never saw anything like that. In, in this case, in this individual, not saying that's a causal relationship, uh, basically tumors in the chest cavity. Cardiac arrest. Tumors in the chest cavity. Pulmonary embolism. Cardiac arrest. Myocardial infarction, myocardial infarction again, myocardial infarction again. Out of respect, not go much further. You see the, um, uh, you can see basically what's going on. Uh, basically, you know, you have some difference in reference to that. Um, you can go through each one. You can get an idea of what's going on. Uh, but you can get it as far as the connections, but to proceed forward. Uh, we have 5,468 non-duplicated reports to VAERS. So I'll add that to the prior year so you can get a running total in regard to the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, this looks cool, but it's not going to tell you much at this point in time. Uh, proceed forward. Myocarditis reports. I remember this is only the first week, so it's actually January 7th, 63 so far. Um, in regard to the age per se, uh, all the way down the line. And then what do we have down here? Severe headaches. Now I'm starting to keep track of severe headaches. Now keep in mind, you say, well, this is January. Where are these all coming back from January, 2021? Against the length of time before the report. And yeah, you are reading six, seven, ten. Six, seven, those reports are coming in on the age. These are severe headaches, just 271 reported to the VARA system. Uh, it has to be severe for me to be able to weed through it uh, to the VARA system so far the first week of January. And I don't think I did anything else on this one. Let me just see real fast. Looking at the data frames. Yeah, that's that covers that one up. Europe, you do vigilance right now. Since they basically continue, they continue forward, we're looking at 1 million, right there, 389,404 vaccine adverse event reports reported to Endure Vigilance. And again, uh, they finally updated after about 21 days. They were down. So if we look at their, their thing right here, yeah, after 21 days, so the 15th of January, 2022, for example, that's actually the Pfizer vaccine. So they're, they're maintaining a running total, which is a little easier to work with than basically go by year by year basis, which we're currently doing right now with the uh, the CDC reports, CDC uh, database, VARES. All right, and then let's look at mutations. And we're gonna be actually finished actually, I think before 60 minutes. Let's give it a second here, real fast. I don't know why it takes so long between the pages. All right, tell me if you notice a pattern here. All right, as it begins to move, ready? We'll come back to that in a second. What are we looking at here? We are looking at people fully vaccinated per 100. 
So right here is people fully vaccinated, whatever fully vaccinated means, as 60 or more. All right, and what are we looking at here on the y-axis? New cases moved per million. Do you see a pattern by some chance? Right there, you see a pattern? Countries which are less than 60, basically, people vaccinated per 100? Yeah, that's just the way it is. Now, let's go back up here, give more perspective. Give it a second to come back. Do, do, do. There it goes. All right, now check this out. Total cases per million. Remember, you see this is the vaccinated part right there. 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, so on and so forth. Tell me if you notice a correlation and benefit of the inoculations. New deaths per million. 81 to 100 inoculated. Uh, 71 to 100 inoculated, so on and so forth. Again, these countries keep on popping up. Uh, you know, you could say some benefit there but I'm not noticing the correlation there. Uh, reproduction rate, zero to 10. I guess they just gave up. And then compare it to other countries. Does vaccinating more really result in a necessarily overall reduction in reproduction rate? I don't know. Because the reproduction rate seems to be totally confounded by new cases smooth per million. Here we are. The countries which are not very much vaccinated do they have a higher seroprevalence through natural immunity? That's not for me to answer, but it's a good question. And then all of a sudden, this, this zone right here between 71 and 80, remember last week it was at 1,500 new cases smooth per million? I had to readjust the x-axis, the y-axis, I'm sorry, y-axis again to take the new number, 1,700 new cases per million. You notice a correlation, a pattern? Do you see any benefit to inoculation? At least a reference to new cases smooth per million. You could say severe cases and mortality and everything else like that. Um, but then I would expect to see that here as well. I would expect these countries to be much higher than the countries which are higher, highly inoculated, and I don't see it. I'm sorry. From a data standpoint, there could be other confounding factors, but regardless of that, and I'd be open mind to it, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. I understand the hypothesis and the conjecture, but at this point in time, you have to ask yourself the question, does thou detest protest too much? And proceed forward. That's our thing right there. And I think we couldn't get into it. Now, see, here's our scatter matrix. What are we looking at here once again? People fully vaccinated per 100. New cases smooth per million. Notice a pattern? Yeah, that's kind of what it looks like, doesn't it? And this is the countries again, as you go down the line here. I don't think I have any further data in reference to that. Um, yeah, we saw this before, I can flip back and forth, but then I'm just reiterating things that we've already seen a million times over. Uh, you know, this country is hardly vaccinated, Bulgaria, but it has a high mortality per million but I don't necessarily see a correlation because it's almost like if you take out this one outlier, it's, it's almost like a, a bell curve. And that's just the way it is. Boosters, let's see how boosters look. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, well, it's the number of boosters, uh, just as far as it's been handed out. Really weird, because a lot of these countries, for example, like right down here, uh, they're not fully vaccinated, but they're handing out a lot of boosters. Odd, but just the same. That's what we're, that's what we're here to pick up, and then the case rates, the positivity rates in Singapore and Belgium, and so on and so forth. So let us conclude. We went through all the data as follows, and I got, as soon as it renders to 4K, I'll have it all available for you with the links and bookmarked for you, so you can look at the data right at the bat. So you don't have to go through our entire diatribe or reiterate through it once again. So what do we care? We're going backwards, bum, 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 just for fun. We looked at basically pandemic trust in governments, really good in the beginning, not so good in the long run. Face masks make you uh, more attractive, like like that should be even a thing. All right, being researched. After that, um, but again, so it's a social research. 
Yeah, but however, though, is it pertinent? I don't know. It'd be nice if people were nicer to each other. Does it require a mask to be nice to a person? That's not for me to determine. Uh, new uh, safety signals, uh, but it gives a great explanation in regard to uh, how, if this may have some sort of connection, how it may have it. And it's important to be known because I noticed a lot of people who discovered the past few weeks are suffering from bad headaches and never even had headaches before. Um, it's best to know now so it can be mitigated in the future if there is a connection. Uh, viral dynamics. Omicron is a whole different game. It, getting these things about saying the viral load uh, as far as in the mouth and the nose doesn't seem to be related to the uh, infectiousness. It's being repeated in multiple studies. And so the question is, how uh, is it being transmitted? And that's a real pressing question right off the bat. UVC light would be a great answer for that because if you had UVC light around, then maybe you don't have to worry so much about the viral load. So again, we covered that. Hemp acids, I did the video on that, and but also linked the research here as well, just to reiterate. T cells from the common cold shows you what the common cold infections can do for you uh, as opposed to not recommending anybody get ill or use that as a mitigating factor. So let's caveat that. But how natural infection to certain elements in the environment can yield you benefit against other nasties. And then wonderful article in reference to the lung microbiome, the gut microbiome and the immune system. And basically the new kid on the block to look out for in reference to beneficial bacteria, Lactobacillus plantarum. Again, once again, thank you very much for watching. Gratitude to all the researchers out there as always. And so, and uh, again, just food for thought as we conclude. Do, do, do. Whoops, once again. There we are. Let's see if we can get this like this. And then we do it like this. And we do it like this. There we are. That's kind of. The first week of January compared to the whole year of these right here. Serious, serious, serious uh, reflection. Uh, that has to be taken into account and that's just week one just week one compared to entire years i know i repeated myself a couple of times in that but i it's i it's to me it's just unbelievable per se and yet that we just still continue on forward uh with even a higher mortality rate leaky vaccines and so on and so forth like somehow it's just going to magically get better and but still just the same uh there's other options out there a lot of good research a lot of good science uh just be kind of cool if they used it again ralph signing off once again gratitude for watching i look forward to you all once again next week see you then bye